Well, greetings out there in YouTube land and welcome to today's video extravaganza featuring the contents of this giant box. And when I say giant, I mean it. For comparison, here is a Vox AC30, just to show you how big that box really is. And uh, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure what's in it. So let's get this box opened and the contents lifted at risk of herniation up here onto the workbench so we can get started on our next assignment. Well, step one, uh, the tape's been cut and we can see the packing material here. It's beautifully packed. This is about the fifth or sixth amp in a row that I've received. It's been very well packed. I really appreciate it uh, from you all. So let's go ahead and start removing all this packing material and see what uh, secrets await. You know, while I'm at it, I had to comment on the weather. Yesterday was 101. Today is 60 degrees with all sorts of wind and rain and absolutely wonderful weather for a change. But uh, it just shows you, uh, if you don't like the weather today, just wait till tomorrow. Well, I got all that cover packing material off and we've got like a secondary package inside as well as probably the box containing the tubes and shields. Okay, so let's try to extract this and get it open and see what's uh, inside. So beautifully packed. Well, the sarcophagus of King Tut has been removed uh, from the burial chamber here. Uh, it looks like it's sandwiched in foam. Uh, let's go ahead and cut around the equator here and uh, open this gray clam up and see what's inside. If you enjoy preposterous metaphors, you've come to the right place. Well, the oyster's been opened, and it looks like we have a silver face twin reverb chassis. Hopefully the reverb tank's in here, too. We've got the separate box here with the tubes. Sure enough, I hoisted the chassis up, and nestled underneath it was the reverb tank. It looks like it may have pressed in on the components here on the eyelet board and maybe smash some of them flat. Uh, you know, one point I'm going to make here is it's, I always like to put a, a piece of cardboard, stiff, thick cardboard along the bottom of the chassis to keep any sort of penetration during transport from coming in here and damaging the board or any of the components that are soldered to the board. Okay, other than that though, this was the darndest packing job I've ever seen. Just on a hunch, I went ahead and pulled the reverb tank out of the rather musty smelling uh, original vinyl bag. Um, just because I want to make sure nothing had happened to it. And it is a mod replacement tank uh, for AB3C1B. Uh, to be honest, I, if, I kind of prefer, if you're going to have to replace an original tank, I've had better luck with the mod tanks than I have with the Accutronics tanks. Okay, they just, they're not quite as shrill, they just seem to be a little more vintage sounding. Okay, so, looks like a decent tank, it is a replacement, they have new cables and they even color coded uh, one of the uh, RCA jacks. So let's set this aside and take a look at the chassis. Well, here's the chassis, uh, looks like it's had a good stout three-wire power cord installed really clean uh, original looking chassis uh, it was sent with the uh, smaller tubes the 12 uh, A series tubes uh, in place with the tube shields which is actually not a bad idea okay the other tubes the bare exposed tubes uh, were removed and packed in the separate box I looked and all the transformers seem to be correct uh, we'll have to unscrew the Phillips screws and get the doghouse uh, cover off. I have a feeling it's been completely recapped. We'll see in just a minute. Okay, let's lift off the doghouse cover. And yes, it's been recapped. Looks like Sprague Adams. And here's our first test of the day. What's wrong with this picture? Okay, don't we always put our values up on top? They're nicely aligned, they're parallel, everything looks good, but who knows what the values are without rotating them and endangering breaking off one of the leads. 
Okay, so uh, I'm going to set down the camera and do that just so I can uh, get in my mind the fact that these are the correct values and are wired in the correct places. One other thing I'm not very excited about is that the leads from the electrolytic capacitors were not soldered to the eyelets in most cases, but were twisted around the wire coming from the eyelet and uh, just sort of connected in that uh, manner. These actually appear to have been soldered properly into the eyelet. Uh, this really is not the best way to do this. Eyelet boards are made to have components removed and replaced easily. Okay, so it's really not excusable to do this. And they've cut the lead so short I can't straighten them out and do it right. So the next person who opens this thing up is going to look in here and say, hey, who was the last guy that worked on this? And my name will be mentioned and they'll think, oh, what a shabby craftsman he is. So uh, I guess we'll just have to live with it. Also, I'm going to have to unsolder this cap because I can't see the value on it. Normally these three are the same and this one's different. This, all I could get was the model number of the capacitor. I'll have to go look it up. Uh, but when you fail to put the values on top, you're really doing the next guy a disservice. Okay, so be real careful about that. Also, we'll have to check these resistors. It doesn't look like they've been changed, uh, which may be worrisome also. Okay, after I lifted this one up, I could get way down here and read the value on this one. So here are the values of the capacitors with their polarity. Uh, now we need to take the serial number from the chassis, go in, uh, look this up on the internet, figure out exactly what it is, and download an, an appropriate schematic. From that then we'll double check these values to see if they're correct. I have a feeling they will be. Um, I also am going to make a wild guess that this is a 1968 Silverface, the first year of Silverfaces, and therefore uh, if it is a console lamp, as I believe it is, uh, it's going to have that uh, aluminum, that drip edge around the grill cloth. Okay, uh, one uh, of the reasons I think so is I see a very faint 68 here that just may be a coincidence, um, but it's just the feeling I have. So I'm going to go in, check it out, I'll be right back. Well, I'm back, and as predicted, uh, judging from the serial number on the chassis, uh, this was made in like the third or fourth month of 1968. I believe it is the AB763 circuit. There's four different circuits for twin reverbs and silver face, but I think it's this one and I'll show you why. If you look down here at the internodal resistors, we have 1K and 4700. We look over here, we see 1K, 4700. On the other circuits, those internodal resistors are completely different. So, I think it's the AB763, which is kind of the traditional circuit that uh, I see most often, uh, and that's what I'm going to go with. Also, a couple observations. We see that the uh, three electrolytic capacitors are 20, 20, 20, and we have here two 30s and a 20, remember. Uh, so I think somebody is being creative and boosting the value of the filter caps. Uh, probably somewhere there's a site on the internet that says that's a good idea. Uh, these here are in series and we know that in series the uh, capacitance is half and the uh, voltage that the uh, capacitor can tolerate will double. So uh, these will add up to 50 microfarads at 700 volt and originally it was 35 microfarads at 700 volts so once again these are a little higher than uh, what was originally supplied but that's really no problem at all I think that'll work just fine um, as far as these uh, I'm gonna guess they're gonna work just fine too but you cannot, as we discussed before, just start raising capacitor values in the filtration network. 
because once you plug the amp in and turn it on these are like dead shorts and you're going to flow all sorts of current while you're charging these and the one saving grace is in this amp of course we know that we're going to have diode rectification so we're not going to be damaging a rectifier tube by increasing the value of these caps so I really don't think there's a big problem there the only thing you might damage would be the um, high voltage winding on the power transformer uh, and I I really doubt that that's going to happen okay so we'll accept these altered values uh, solder this back in and then start looking around for other things that we need to address and change like maybe the value of these two resistors. I tested the resistance and both of these are right on the money so let's cover up our uh, electrolytic uh, array here for now and um, start looking at the circuit itself. Doghouse lids back on and before we flip this over there's something I noticed here that caught my eye that seems strange. I have a little hole here and a grommet right there uh, as if a wire came out from between two of the uh, 6L6's. When we uh, flip this over and look in at the circuit maybe there'll be a clue as to what that's all about. Uh, it's been undone, whatever it was, but it just seems very strange. Okay, let's flip it over. Okay, let's take a close look here at the circuit. Uh, it's been heavily worked on. Um, looks like all the diodes have been replaced as well as the filter cap for the uh, bias negative DC supply. Um, somebody's put in a virtual center tap for the 6 volt filament circuit. However, I don't think that's necessary because I believe one of these two grounded wires here is the high voltage center tap and I believe the other one is the 6 volt uh, filament center tap and you really don't need or want to do both if you've got a legitimate center tap for your 6 volt winding you really don't need to be doing this okay and uh, what I'll have to do is unsolder both of these determine if one of them really is the center tap of the 6 volt winding I don't know what else it would be because there's only two center taps uh, on the power transformer and um, here they are but uh, I'll have to verify that and then I will undo this. Next we look down here and we have like metal oxide uh, screen resistors and um, it looks like the grid stoppers have been left alone. We'll have to double check those. Okay here we know is the uh, bias pot which is a real nice touch on these larger fender amps. Uh, let's see, do we see any replacement potentiometers? I think that one looks pretty suspicious right there. That's about it. Um, see a little fresh solder right down there. Going to have to check all these pots, of course. Make sure that they're quiet and of the proper value. With all the work that's been done on this, you, you really have to double check everything to make sure that mistakes were not made. Um, cathode bypass caps have all been replaced. There's our, our tremolo oscillator loop caps, smashed flat maybe by the uh, revert tank that was put underneath here. Um, you know, I'm not seeing much else here that's catching my eye. I have a feeling this amp was purchased and sent to me to be checked out before the owner started using it. Um, it looks like some pretty good work has been done on it. And uh, he just wanted me to check it out completely before he uh, started using it. And I'm very flattered by that and I will do my best for him to guarantee that this amp will perform as at its absolute best and for as long as possibly or possible either. I guess I got so emotional there I forgot my lines. 
That's a wild looking maneuver there. It looks like a daddy long legs. Okay, I, I kind of like to keep all of the leads as short as possible. But you could admit, that's, that's pretty creative. Wow, some heavily roasted insulation here. I'm assuming that's when that glob of solder was put down there that the soldering iron came in contact with uh, these wires. You have to be careful uh, you don't have bare wire showing. That's, that would be lovely, wouldn't it? If this is like 350 volts and it comes up here and touches the leaf uh, on your vibrato channel input and thus energizes the strings of your guitar with 350 volts. Some kind of fun, huh? While I'm waiting for the big soldering iron to warm up so that I can release these uh, center taps to verify that one of them is the 6.3 volt uh, center tap. Uh, I was looking here and I see 368 which to me would be the third month of 1968. Like I said earlier based on the serial number which was about a quarter of the way through the series that would put it at around March of 1968. So this is a fairly early version then of the Silverface uh, Twin Reverb. Now there's a lesson here to be learned about these uh, Silverface Fender amps, especially the early ones in 68 and 69. Bear in mind that this is an AB763 circuit. Well, a whole bunch of the blackface twin reverbs were AB763s also. So, people turn their nose up at Silverface Fender sometimes, uh, but you're crazy to do so because the Silverface uh, amps cost less than the blackface, but in this case, this one is absolutely identical. Now, if you're fortunate enough to find a blackface Fender Twin Reverb and can afford it, then by all means get it, keep it, and enjoy it forever. But if you're like a lot of people who have a hard time swinging $2,500 or so for an amplifier, but you can find a late 60s or early 70s silver face twin reverb, then by all means get it because the circuits are identical. You can enjoy the same tone as the blackface version, but for a whole lot less money. Well, I desoldered the two grounded center taps, and sure enough, the uh, yellow with the red stripes is the high voltage center tap and this is the 6.3 volt filament center tap. So there really is no need for a virtual center tap if you've already got the real thing. Okay, so I'm going to remove this. Um, it, it's just a needless complication and also it's leaking uh, some of the 6 volt uh, current to the ground. Okay, so uh, let's get rid of it. Okay, those 100 ohm resistors have been removed from the circuit and now I will reground the two center taps right down here. This is kind of unusual. It looks like maybe there was another three wire power cord installed and it was grounded right here and then they installed a different one and just cut that off and soldered the ground lead right to the chassis. Many people would prefer this soldered directly to the chassis but uh, I'm going to go ahead and unscrew this and remove it. It's just kind of unsightly. Okay, we're soldered down and don't be shy about trying to pull wires loose from when you've soldered them to different places. Go ahead and yank on them, okay? I don't suggest that you, you know, swing the chassis around your head, uh, but pull on them. Make sure that they're, they're well secured. Okay, so that much is cleaned up. Um, now we've got to look for trouble somewhere else. On close examination, these grid stoppers here on each of these uh, two bases, uh, they're fresh shiny resistors. Uh, they were changed. They just didn't use the metal oxide resistors like they did for the screens. Okay, so those are fine. I'm kind of running out of things to worry about here and I'm almost tempted turn this over, plug it into the current limiter, plug in the tubes and check the tube bias. Now on a amp like this with four output tubes that will present a special challenge and it's one that I think uh, a bunch of you might uh, 
actually gain by watching. Okay, you'll learn something because it is a little different. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. We'll turn it over, plug in the uh, 6L6GCs, and then uh, do our best to bias this. Well, we got a mini sarcophagus here with our tubes inside, like the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. Um, so let me get out my razor blade and start carving away here so that we can get into the cocoon and rescue our tubes. Well, um, well, I'm really not sure what to make of the uh, set of four output tubes. One side says uh, performance tested for Ampeg amps. Then you roll it over and they're groove tubes. Uh, tubes, it's a match set of four. But here's the problem. It says 6L6B. Now in my book, the 6L6B does not belong in a 6L6GC circuit. These things are going to be operating at 460 plate volts. They're supposed to be flowing uh, what they can handle up to 30 watts of plate dissipation, whereas GBs uh, can only handle a fraction of that. If, unless GB means something else, uh, 6L6B means something else, uh, then what I think it means, I don't think this is the right set of tubes. Not only that, but one of the locator pins is broken off, which I think is a disaster. Um, yeah, it's possible to pay real close attention, you know, and try, oh, let's see, try to get this in right, or put a little dot where the notch, there's the notch right there where it would have been, and then hope to God you can get it in the right place, and if you don't, the end result is, makes the 4th of July look like Labor Day weekend, okay, so, um, I'm going to do a little research on these tubes. Okay, you all may know more about them than I do. You probably do, but uh, I just have no experience with this specific designation on groove tubes. So, back inside to the computer, and I will return shortly. Well, after a bunch of looking, I came up with this. Groove tubes, 606B Quartet Russian. Okay, um, I love this get an old-time rock and roll sound with plenty of mid-range punch when you install the 6L6B Quartet uh, which is all fine and dandy all these words like uh, they use with wine you know uh, a very heady aroma and all of this but nothing about any actual uh, plate dissipation or plate current uh, ratings or anything like that nothing specific just uh, old-time rock and roll sound. Okay, what garbage. This is nonsense. I'm surprised they don't use terms like subtle bouquet with just a hint of wood, which actually sounds like a first date. Next time somebody asks me about plate dissipation or uh, plate current, I'll say, oh, who cares about that? All you need is old-time rock and roll sound. Okay, I'm disgusted. I have no idea uh, where to bias these tubes, uh, at what value. Um, I don't know. Well, I got all excited. I thought, well, yeah, of course, now here are the specifications. Oh, well, shipping weight one pound, shipping dimensions seven by five by five. Boy, this is critical information, isn't it? I mean, who cares about the performance characteristics, uh, the plate voltage, the plate current, the plate dissipation? We'll know the shipping dimensions, though. After looking through the uh, CE distribution catalog on the Internet, uh, I found these uh, tube amp doctor tubes, which I have ordered before, and the 6L6 WGC. And if you look down here, they actually have a... Uh, specification sheet that is legit. Okay, DC plate voltage 550 volts, screens 450, cathode current 150 milliamps, 30 watt plate dissipation. So it sounds like they uh, actually exceed the requirements that we have here for the twin amp. So since this tube brand actually states it's operational uh, uh, characteristics. I'm more uh, inclined to uh, go ahead and order a quartet of these matched.
Well, how about that? During our discussion on how to bias quad amp circuits, our match set of four uh, new uh, 6L6 output tubes just arrived, so let's get them out of their boxes and into the uh, amplifier and start our biasing procedure. Well, we got the boxes all open and our brand new tube set is sitting here on the top of the workbench. The characteristic that you pay for when you pay a little extra for matched tubes is the plate current. And under exactly the same conditions, all four of these tubes flowed uh, 37 milliamps of plate current. Uh, now since the plate voltage that will be applied to all four of them will be equal, uh, the plate dissipation then, which we know is the product of those two measurements, uh, should be identical for all four. We know it won't be exactly identical, but it'll be really close, hopefully. Okay, so let's plug these in and get started on our biasing procedure. Now all four of our brand new 6L6s are installed in their tube sockets and like I said, although I have the two Eurotubes BIOS probes, I'm going to do this uh, just manually because most of you don't have the probes and also it's, I think, easier to follow if you watch it step by step. Now remember we said we're dealing with two pairs of tubes. Each pair is wired in parallel. Let's identify the pairs. Here are the wires from our output transformer secondary. We've got a blue and a brown. Blue wire comes over here to the plate of, I would say, let's call this A, B, C to 606C. And then you see a brown wire comes over here and connects to the plate on D. So this is one pair. Brown wire comes over here to the plate and another wire goes over. So this is A and B are a parallel pair. C and D are a parallel pair. Now because I have two identical digital multimeters, uh, I'm going to use them both just to speed things up a little. If you only have one, then you'll just have to do each portion of this individually. But what I've done is I've connected the positive probe on the plate pin here of pair AB and the positive probe of the second digital multimeter over here to uh, pair CD, pl the plate. Okay, then the other end, the black or negative leads, go over here to the center tap, which is almost always red in fenders, but the center tap, remember this is where the wires are coming from, the uh, output transformer, uh, and this right here will be the center tap. We hook on there. Then we will turn to ohms of resistance and measure the resistance of the half winding of, of the uh, part of the output transformer secondary that goes to pair AB and that half winding that goes to CD. Let's write this down on a sheet of paper. So I've shown a pair AB and the uh, secondary resistance of the half winding and it's 35.8 ohms and then for all you dyslexics out there uh, the half winding for pair CD is 38.5 ohms. Okay, so we have that down. Now leaving the probes in exactly the same position, you don't touch them, we're going to crank over here to DC volts, not AC, that's the squiggly, DC is the little flat line, go to DC volts, plug in the amp, turn it on, and let it stabilize, then we're going to measure the voltage drop across this half winding and across this half winding. Our new tubes are lighting up quite nicely. Okay, we're going to let it warm up here. I've got it on, but uh, on standby. Let it warm up for a little while. And then we're going to switch it off of standby and then watch as our uh, voltage drop stabilizes for each of those half windings. Okay, we're off of standby and you can see that voltage is jumping around a bit and it will because we have a tremolo 
uh, in this circuit. Uh, what I'll do is turn off the tremolo by pulling that uh, jumper plug. That should help some. Okay, let's let it stabilize and then see if we can't get readings. Also notice it's negative because it's a drop. Okay, the voltage is less after the winding than it is before, so that's a negative change. And uh, let's let it stabilize and we'll write down the values. Okay, the voltage drop uh, for a pair AB is uh, minus 2.23 volts and for CD it's 2.38 volts. Also you notice that the resistance was a little higher on the CD half winding so you expect a little greater voltage drop than on the lower resistance half winding. So right now it looks like we've got a pretty good match between these tubes so let's get out our calculator and divide this by this and see what we have as far as plate current. And when we divide, we see uh, that the plate current is 62.3 milliamps, which you'd normally grab your throat, you know, and, and faint. But no, remember, we have to divide that by 2. And the CD pair, which is very closely matched, look at that, it's within 0 0.5 milliamps, uh, 61.8. Okay, so let's divide them by 2 and see what our average plate current is for A and B and the average for C and D. And sure enough, a whole lot more uh, acceptable, 31.2 milliamps, 30.9 milliamps. Now, these are kind of low for 6L6s, but now we have to determine the plate voltage. Okay, we'll put that here, multiply, and we'll get our plate dissipation. So now let's measure the plate voltage. And to do that, we will simply move our negative probes from the uh, center tap, of the output transformer secondary to ground. Okay, the, I put them to two separate grounds simply because uh, there was no convenient way to put them to the same ground. But anyway, we simply ground those. Remember, you ground, uh, you measure your plate voltage to ground when you have grid biased output tubes. Okay, we'll stay on the a DC voltage. Take it off a of standby. Let it stabilize and write down the number. What do you think? 410? How about 410? Well, how about that? A plate dissipation is within one-tenth of a watt, 12.8 for pair AB, 12.7 for pair CD. Now, is that acceptable? If not, we can crank up the bias a little bit with our bias adjustment on this particular circuit. If you don't have a bias adjustment, you'll have to alter uh, the uh, resistance in the negative DC bias supply. But for us, we're fortunate. And just uh, for demonstration's sake, let's bring these up just a little bit higher, say to around mm, 13.5 or so, something like that, just so that we can see how to do it. Okay, I'm going to crank here uh, on this pot with an insulated screwdriver and uh, let's make a quick calculation as to what type of voltage drop we think will yield about a 13.5 plate dissipation. Oh and before I do that I just want to remind you that plate dissipation is the uh, plate current in amps so I had to move the decimal over three places so I multiplied 0.0312 times 410, 0.0309 times 410 to get that value. Has to be in amps for Ohm's Law. Now to come up with a ballpark figure for a voltage drop that will give us 13.5 watts of plate dissipation, I set up a simple proportional uh, statement here. If 2.23 voltage drop gives me 12.8 watts of plate dissipation, then the unknown voltage drop will give me 13.5. If you cross multiply and then divide, you'll find that it's around 2.35 volts. A voltage drop should give us around 13.5 watts of plate dissipation. Let's see if that's So we leave our positive probes where they are on the plates, move our negatives from ground back to the center tap, 
flip the standby switch, let this stabilize, and then we'll start cranking the bias pot back here to see if we can't get uh, about 2.35 volts of voltage drop. Now the lower values here are the ones I just did, the ones after cranking up the bias pot a little bit. You see the voltage drop went up, plate current increased, half of it is now 32.8 also, you have to redo your plate voltage because when the current goes up, the voltage goes down. And you see it went down a little bit, 4 volts, but now we have 13.3 watts, which is pretty darn close to what we wanted. Uh, I think that's a really good plate dissipation. Uh, the CD pair uh, had a little bit greater voltage drop because the resistance is higher. Plate current a little higher, half of that's 32.5, which is almost exactly the same as the AB pair. 406 uh, plate volts was exactly the same. 13.2 watts and 13.3 watts. I think that's just an ideal dissipation for this amp, and that's the way we'll leave it. All right, we've double checked our voltages, our uh, capacitors, we have biased our new output tube set we're plugged into our current limiter uh, I'm going to turn it on and inject a 400 cycle per second tone into channel 1 here and uh, let's see if our pots are quiet if our tremolo works we'll have to plug into channel 2 for that and see if our reverb uh, makes noise now and if all that works then I think we're ready for a audio demo I also have the shop speaker plugged in here to the cabinet speaker jack. Now the uh, output transformer secondary wants to see 4 ohms. It wants to see two 8 ohm speakers in parallel. But for this test at low volume, I'm going to just use the 8 ohm shop speaker. When we do the audio testing to make sure it's optimum, I'm going to plug in another 8 ohm speaker so we have two 8s in parallel just like what the output transformer is, is uh, wound for and we'll have our total of 4 ohms output impedance. Okay, uh, it's been warming up. Let's take it off standby and see what happens. And I know you'll all be really glad to see that yes, the amp is on and the jewel is lit. This is not the audio demo. Uh, this is just a preliminary. All right, let's turn up the volume and listen to our 400 hertz tone that sounds kind of nasal, weak, low volume, but remember that our treble, middle, and bass tone controls are all at uh, absolute minimum. This is a good lesson about what passive tone controls do for you. With all of these at minimum, almost all of the treble, middle, and bass frequencies are going to ground. You have hardly any signal left. Now watch what happens when I turn the treble up. I'm going to have to turn this down now. See, I'm not sending so much of the treble to ground, so now I can hear it, okay? The volume controls come down. Let's do our middle. A little bit louder. Now about our bass softened the tone, didn't it? It's no longer nasal. So treble sends a ton of signal to ground. Now we're down around... Now the signal I'm sending in is not terribly strong. So we've got actually really good volume at two and a half on the volume control. And now that our tone controls aren't sending all of the uh, signal to ground, it sounds good and it's plenty loud enough. Now let's try channel 2. Well I think now you know what to expect. Weak nasal tone. Watch here, we'll crank up the trouble. Wow. Oh God. Down to about two and a half. Go to five. Five. Listen to that. The nasal just turned nice and warm at a base setting of 5. Now, we can crank the treble up even higher. It gets louder 
and it gets a lot more trouble. So you can test your tone controls with just a signal generator and see uh, just how much signal you're sending to ground and if they work or not. The bass definitely warmed up the tone, the treble uh, made it a lot uh, kind of harsher and sharper and more trebly. Middle doesn't do all that much and to be honest compared to the treble and bass it really doesn't. Okay the middle frequencies I think are a narrower band. So anyway we've got excellent volume, good tone controls, quiet pots. Let's try the brightness switch. Woo! Hear how strident that became? Okay, now just for fun, let's see if our tremolo worked. Sure enough. It's pretty fast, too. Maximum intensity. What do we have, like three, three and a half beats per second at its slowest setting? So you know what we're going to do, don't you? Let's see if we can slow this jewel down a little bit. It's also fun to watch the little roach flash there in its uh, bedroll. Okay, let's see if we can slow this jewel down just a little bit. By now I think that most uh, viewers know exactly how this is done. We'll go here to the oscillation loop. And we see we've got 0 0.01, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, very standard Fender oscillation loop. Okay, what we're going to do is increase the capacitance of one of these 0.01s. Let's put a 0.02 in here. Why does that work? Well, it takes longer for a 0.02 microfarad cap to charge than a 0.01. That slows down the oscillation. So, uh, also, you should know by now that these three little pancakes here are your oscillation uh, capacitors. And what we can do is jump uh, a parallel 0.01 across the two leads from this one here and make it a 0.02. By the way, if you're going to work on amps, you better have a whole bunch of caps on hand. Okay, all the standard sizes, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, and two more containers. I get these from Harbor Freight. They're dirt cheap and they really work. But anyway, that's all part of the overhead of working on amps is you're going to have to have a pretty good stock of caps. Let's pick out a .01 and get to work on this tremolo. Now before we do this for keeps, okay, and solder in the cap, I put uh, alligator clip jumpers and I'm doing my .01 in parallel externally like this so I can try other values if I want or connect it in other places. Uh, that way you're not in here soldering, unsoldering and stressing um, your contacts and your components. Okay, clip it in, see if you like it. If you do, then you solder it in. Let's see how this sounds. Okay, we're at lowest speed with the .01 in parallel. Now listen and then I'll disconnect it. Hear the difference? Probably twice as fast without. Then when I clip it back in, that's pretty slow. I kind of like that. What's that, about two per second? Sounds right to me. Let's go with it, okay? One last test uh, will be to see if the reverb tank and circuit are working. Uh, first we have to make sure that we have the cables connected uh, properly. To me the way they connect is counterintuitive. It's in goes to in on the uh, rear of the chassis and out goes to out on the rear of the chassis. To me this out should be this in and vice versa but that's the way it is and it helps if you mark uh, sometimes uh, with some uh, red ink or dye to make it easy to replace the jacks where they belong. This is a fairly simple test. Take the amp off of standby, turn up the volume, turn on the reverb, set to 6, and bounce the tank. And 
we're getting plenty of reverb so uh, the proper test of course requires uh, playing a guitar through this but for now I think we can rest assured that the reverb circuit is indeed working okay we got the .01 uh, soldered in there as neatly as possible now let's do a, a switchable NFB loop just for fun okay that really seems to work on uh, these uh, twin reverbs and uh, bandmasters and now whoever put in the uh, three wire power cord wired it the way it was originally and they actually uh, are using the ground switch okay where you pick which one hums less so I'm gonna have to rewire all of this to get it to where the, the we like it with the black wire from the um, power cord going through the on off switch right here and through the fuse and then to the primary of the power transformer and the white wire going directly to the other primary wire then that will liberate this switch for us to use for our uh, switchable NFB loop. This looks like a European power cord too with the blue and brown and green with a yellow tracer. Okay, I'm going to liberate our toggle switch here from these this octopus of wires. I should say that the uh, original tech did not wire the ground switch uh, in a way that was active. He only used the top two lugs. The bottom lug is the one that's switchable. He was using it more as a terminal strip. I'm going to use the auxiliary uh, receptacle here as my terminal strip. Okay, I'll show you in just a minute. Something I've always wondered about with these European cords is why brown is the hot wire. Okay? Blue sort of makes sense. That's You could think like cold or return. But brown, heck, the only time brown ever gets hot is when you've eaten a lot of spicy food. I have the three-wire power cord uh, wired properly now. I use the uh, auxiliary receptacle here as like a terminal strip where I combine one of the primary wires uh, from the uh, power transformer to the return wire for the power cable and then the other hot wire comes over here connects to a jumper comes down to the toggle switch to the fuse and then into the second of the two primary wires for the power transformer now that ground switch is uh, completely available to us for use to do our switching NFB loop alright the switchable NFB is finished I uh, took the wire that connects right here to the 820 ohm NFB resistor. It comes out of this little gopher hole right here. I, it did originally connect over here to the auxiliary speaker uh, hot lug, but instead I ran it over to our switch to this lug here on the uh, old ground switch and then from the bottom lug, these are the two that are switched on and off, I ran a wire to where the original wire from the NFB resistor went. So now we can switch that NFB loop on and off. On when you're playing weddings and bar mitzvahs, off when you're in hell playing for your soul against Steve Vai. Finally I replaced that wretched old burned up knob with a real nice one that I had in my parts drawer. Well, I think everything that I can do is done, and now it's time to wake Ollie and Jack up from their catnip coma, and let's have them strum a few chords through this jewel and uh, see if we approve. Uh, all of the audio demo has been done with the NFB switched off, and you're going to see why now. I'm going to uh, have Ollie and Jack uh, play a tune, and I'm going to switch the NFB loop on and off, right back here, and uh, just listen to the difference it makes. <laughs>
that's on, that's off. And to me, when I switch it on at kind of moderate volumes, it's almost like you throw a wet blanket over the speaker. It really suppresses the clarity and um, just power of the amp. So I really think this switchable NFB uh, loop, especially on a twin reverb, makes a huge difference. Thank you.
I guess that's about it for this video on the 1968 AB763 Fender Twin Reverb Amp. We checked it out thoroughly for the owner, uh, installed and biased a brand new set of four uh, 6L6 output tubes, created an, a switchable NFB loop, and slowed down the tremolo and a few other fine tuning uh, measures. 
And uh, as you heard in that extended audio demonstration, uh, and it sounds like a million bucks. I wanted to take a few moments to thank all you viewers for subscribing, uh, to thank our Patreon patrons and PayPal contributors for keeping us on the air and advertising free uh, for another month. Should you uh, choose to join them and supporting our channel, uh, I will put links in the video description which will enable you to do so. I also want to thank all the generous viewers who have been sending us nice gifts, including Jay in California who painted this really snazzy impressionistic painting of Jack as a kitten and of Casey lounging on the couch. We really appreciate it, Jay. Uh, and now, without further ado, I think it's time for our part two video, which will be another drone flight with musical accompaniment. Uh, this one is up a really rocky canyon in uh, the Franklin Mountains, uh, where there's this really strange little stone house built up there. You'll see. And then uh, we'll rotate the drone and, for a really stark contrast, take a look at some other houses that have sprung up in the area. I hope you enjoy it and I hope that you'll uh, stay well and stay tuned for future videos. We'll see you then. Bye for now.